The Buddha once said that the reason we go for a sensual pleasure is because we don't see any other alternative to pain. And when he said that, he was giving the basic insight that led to his discovery of the path. He realized there was another alternative. It's the pleasure of form, the pleasure of the mind and concentration, focused on the breath with a sense of ease and well-being, refreshment that spread throughout the whole body. That is the other alternative to pain. And it's a good alternative for several reasons. One is it keeps us from just simply being bounced back and forth between our pleasures and pains. And it gives us a good place to stand so we can understand pleasure and pain, the power they have over the mind. And the Buddha said that his path was a middle way. It wasn't between pleasure and pain, it was between affliction, self-affliction, or being devoted to self-affliction, and then being devoted to sensual pleasures. The middle way is not simply a halfway point between the two of those. In other words, you don't find middling pleasures and middling pains. You devote yourself to something else entirely. You devote yourself to what he calls the heightened mind, and that's the mind in concentration. And from that perspective, you can start understanding what's going on. As the mind gets involved in pleasure and it gets in sensual pleasure and it gets involved in pain, it's not impossible for the mind to be concentrated even though there is pain in the body. This is something that a lot of us misunderstand. They do describe pleasure saturating the whole body when you're in the first jhana. But if there's a pain that you can't work out with a breath, you have to learn how to work around it. In other words, focus not on the pain, but first on the breath energy in the body and seeing what you can do to make that energy pleasant. Give rise to a sense of this pleasure in form, i.e. your sense of the body as you inhabit it from within. And then see how much of the space in the body that's not occupied by the pain you can fill with that sense of well-being. And then think of the good breath energy you're working with penetrating through the pain. And John Lee makes this point. He says if the breath stops at the pain, that just builds up a wall, which gives even more reality to the pain, makes it even more firmly entrenched. But if you can breathe through it, think of the breath energy going right through the pain, permeating the pain. At the very least, it relieves a lot of the tension around the pain. Sometimes it actually can make the pain go away. Or sometimes you'll find that as you work with the breath energy in one part of the body, a pain in another part of the body disappears. I myself found, when I was first meditating, that pains in the knees or pains in the hips often came from the fact that the breath energy wasn't flowing well in the back of the neck or the top of the back. Once the energy down the spine was getting good, then it began to flow down through the through the hips and the legs. And a lot of the pains that came from poor circulation of the breath, poor circulation of the blood, or simply the pinching of the nerves, would go away. But it's not our purpose here to make the pain go away. Remember, the, as the Buddha said, it's, it's to understand pain, and particularly the pain in the mind. This is why when you've worked with the breath and gotten a sense of concentration, that's not enough. It plays a huge role in getting past the pain. As the Buddha said, without the pleasure of concentration, there's no way that discernment would be able to do away with your attachment to pain. Because as long as you don't have this alternative pleasure, then no matter how much you understand the drawbacks of sensual pleasure, you're going to keep going for sensual pleasure. And as you go for sensual pleasure, you find yourself stuck with pain as well, because the two go together. As the sensual pleasure changes, there's going to be pain. So to get back out of that connection, you pull back into the pleasure of, of jhana. And then you, from there you start examining what is this power of the pain over the mind. 
and you realize it's the pow combined power of the pleasure and the perceptions that go around it. Because when there's pain in the body, it's not simply just the feeling there in the body. All these red alerts are being lit up in your brain. Your mind gets worried about the pain. It's just a sign that I'm going to lose my leg. It's just a sign that I'm going to be paralyzed. All sorts of stories, which are simply the fact that you're going to have to sit here for a whole hour with this pain. What if this pain just grows and grows and grows for the hour? Your mind can come up with lots of stories around it. These are all based on your perceptions, the images that the mind uses to communicate with itself. So once you've allowed the mind to step out of the back and forth between sensual pleasure and pain by getting into this sense of well-being, or the pleasure of the pleasure of form, the pleasure of the concentration, you're in a better position to be curious about well, what is it about sensual pleasure and what is it about sen about pain that pulls the mind in. Being able to be curious about these things is a major step. You're not caught in running back and forth and being hit back and forth by the pain and the pleasure. One thing all you can think about is that how much you want the pain to end or how much you want to run away from the pain. Now you've got a place to a safe place to watch it, and then you can begin watching out of curiosity. And the simple fact that you're moving toward the pain to investigate it. means that the pain is not hitting you. You're now a moving target. If you just sit there receiving the pain, it's very easy for it to hit you. So you can ask, what, what is the perception here? And you can test your perceptions by asking yourself some strange questions. Is the pain the same thing as the body? Got a pain in the knee. Is it the same thing as the knee? And part of your mind will say, well, no, of course not, but another part of the mind says yes. So you have to argue with that other part. Take it on. And the reason you haven't taken it before is because the question was so strange. The whole idea was so strange, even though it has power over the mind. A lot of these ideas we have about pain we picked up when we weren't thinking straight. We were little kids, many times before we had language. I mean, that, of course, that was where we first encountered pain. And a lot of our Subconscious feelings about pain come from that time. So you have to investigate them in this way by asking strange questions. Or other questions, not necessarily so strange, but simply the question, where is the sharpest point of the pain right now? And try to follow it. Then you begin to realize it moves around quite a lot. So why did you have this idea that there was this one pain that was frozen in your your leg or in your knee or whatever. Where does that perception come from? Learn how to question that perception. And by prying the perceptions away from the pain for a bit, you begin to see they really are two separate things. And it's the perception that's causing the problem. The perceptions come and they go, and you find that even though the pain may be steadily there in your leg, or relatively steady, the actual amount by which your mind is bothered by the pain goes up and down as the perceptions come and go. That insight right there helps to loosen up a lot of the hold that the pain has on the mind. Of course, you have to come up with your own strange questions because you have your own strange ideas of relating, relating to pain or understanding pain. And this is where the ingenuity factor in discernment comes in. Learning how to ask new questions about the pain coming up, coming at it from another angle. You might ask yourself, where are you in the body in relationship to the pain? Say the pain is in your knee, you're up here in your head. What if you put yourself in your foot? Your sense of where you are, be in your foot or your calf, below the pain. What would that do to your perception of it? And you perceive the pain as solid? Well, think of it 
being just composed of, it's not even atoms, it's because it's not even the body. So how is it going to be a solid? Ask these questions from the point of view of the relative ease of your concentration. Having the concentration that is important, being committed or being devoted to light and mind is a really important part of the practice. We don't just sit here saying, well, I'm just going to be equanimous about what, everything that comes up and patient with everything that comes up. That can last for the amount of time that your determination is strong. But the mind gets hungry without some sense of well-being that it can go for. Blatantly, it's going to go secretly when you're not looking, trying to feed off this, feed off that. And it just opens up more avenues for pain to come into the mind, because now the mind is being dishonest with itself. So feed the mind well with a sense of being devoted to the heightened mind. So you don't have to be devoted to the pursuit of sensual pleasure or the, or the running away from pain. And take advantage of the fact that you do have this alternative between pain and sensual pleasure. Learn how to use it. Because it is the middle way, and it is the way that, as the Buddha said, leads to what is noble. If you find yourself disturbed by pain, don't go for what the Buddha calls household pleasure. You have to go for renunciate pain. In other words, the pain of there's work to be done. I've got to do it. The fact that you're still worked up about the pain means there's work to be done. Okay, do that work. Don't try to soothe yourself by saying, well, just learn how to be equanimous about all this, or non-reactive to all this. That's just a momentary self. The Buddha actually encourages you to go for what he calls renunciant pain, is the realization there's work to be done, I've got to do it, but it's good work. And it's work that's done from the sense of well-being that comes, the pleasure form that comes from working with the breath. Because that is what really heightens the mind, is from the perspective of the heightened mind that you can get beyond these things. The Buddhist image of discernment is of a person standing in a tower looking down on the people below. In this case, the people below are all the thoughts of the mind that are rushing around, worried about pain, worried about pleasure. You're up here and you can look at them. You don't have to identify with them. And John Lee's comment is interesting. Learn to get to the position where you can see the words pleasure and sensual pain as things that people say in jest. They're not big issues for the mind. If you can heighten your mind to that point, then you're safe wherever you go.